question 12 from the textbook. We're dealing with in the more interesting case where we have a bond that trades between coupon payment dates. This is the this is the more realistic scenario. It's very rare that you know the bond trades exactly on a coupon payment date and things are quite as straightforward as it's been in so far. Here we're dealing with a more realistic situation. So we have a $25,000 10% bond. So bond rates 10%, redeemable at par. Redeemable at par just means it's redeemable at that $25,000. It could be redeemable at 101% uh, of par or 1.1 times by that $25,000. It could be redeemable at 103% of par. So 1.3 to 1.03 times by that $25,000, okay? So often it's just redeemable at, at at par, it's just redeemable at the face value, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. So it's redeemable at par on December the 1st, 2028. It's purchased on September the 25th, 2014, yields 7.6% compounded semi-annually, and the bond interest is also payable semi-annually. Okay, so now we have our set of three questions that are the typical kind of run together whenever we're dealing with uh, bond pricing between coupon payment dates. The first one is what is the cash price of the bond? You know, how much do you actually pay for it? The second one, uh, is what's the accrued rate and the third one is what's the quoted price. Finding the cash price of the bond, that's where all the work happens. That's where all the heavy lifting occurs. It's all the brain sweat, all piles into that cash price. Why sweaty? Because basically to calculate that cash price requires us to use almost every component of finance math that we know right now. We have to work with an annuity. We have to work with compound interest. We gotta, we gotta roll with that days between dates calculation. Right? And so we got to bring all that together in one problem. It's all stuff we've done. Individually, we've all done it. It's not like there's some new, really complex wrinkle. We, we, there are a lot of complex wrinkles in there, but we're not going to deal with them. Okay. So, um, so it, it all kind of focuses in on that question. There's also what is the accrued interest? That's pretty straightforward. And what is the quoted price? Quoted price. Uh, it's just the difference between the cash price and the accrued interest. Okay, so gets the, the, the two parts. Those the next two questions are pretty easy, but there is some, you know, some work involved in finding the cash price. So with that work involved in finding the cash price, let's do up a timeline here. Timeline's very important. Anytime we're trying to keep everything all neatly organized, timeline is key. First thing we know. The bond is redeemable on December the 1st, 2028. Okay, so let's get that on our timeline. December the 1st, 2028. The second thing we see is it's purchased on September the 25th, 2014. Let's get that on our timeline as well. So those are our two dates that we know. Now the thing we need to keep track of is when those coupon payments happen. Right? Step one in this process is we find the purchase price of the bond as of the most recent coupon payment date. That's our step one. Now, we need to figure out when was the most recent coupon payment date. To find that out, we need to know when the coupon payment dates happen. One thing we do know for sure is that on December the, 20, December the 1st, 2028, two things are going to happen. One, we're going to get a coupon payment. Two, we're going to get the face value of that bond. So every December the 1st is a coupon payment date. Every December 1st. Well, when's the other one? Well, if they're payable semi-annually. It means those coupon payments are paid every six months. Well, what's six months from December? Uh, I start counting with the fingers, right? January, February, March, April, May, June, okay, June the 1st is the next coupon payment date. And then after June the 1st is the December 1st coupon. And then after December is the June 1st coupon. And then after June is the December 1st coupon. And we could keep going on with that pattern until December 1st, 2028 occurs. We get our last coupon payment date. The bond is done, okay? So it just kind of continues on with that pattern. Okay, so now 
we know when the coupon payment dates occur. So now we got to think, well, September the 25th, 2014. September 25th, does that fall between December and June? Or does it fall between June and December? So we got to keep track of our math. Months here, maybe get a calendar if it's that rusty for you. <laughs> okay, and I go, okay, it happens between June and December. So June... 1st, 2014, and then December 1st, 2014, and the date of sale falls between those two particular coupon payment dates. So we now know that the most recent coupon payment date happens on June the 1st, 2014. So we're going to find the value of that bond on June the 1st, 2014. Right? Using the, the, the basic tools that we've used um, in the previous questions. P O I and C over Y. So on June the 1st, 2014, how many coupon payments do we have remaining? Now we could go through the process as that we've discussed before, where I look at June the 1st, 2014, and in 2014 I have one coupon payment remaining. Right? Again, looking at the world from the perspective of milliseconds after that June 1st, 2014 coupon payment date. I still have one more coupon payment date on December the 1st. And then in 2015, I have two more payments. And in 2016, I have two more payments and so on. So I could look at it in the, in the lens of in 2014, there's one payment. 2015, there's two payments. 2016, there's two payments. And I can keep going that on until you get to 2028, and there's still a June and a December payment. Okay. Whenever we have semi-annual coupon payment dates and the most recent coupon payment date, or then the starting point, if you will, is different than the ending point, we know we're going to look at an odd number. And we're going 2, 4, 6, 8, blah, 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 blah. And then plus 1, we know we're going to get an odd number. There's a slightly faster way to do this. And this, you know, tallying up year by year, there's nothing wrong with that. It takes a, takes a minute or two. Um, for the final exam, you have that minute or two to take it. So if, if you're more comfortable doing it that way, please do it that way. It's, it's better to get it right than to get it fast in this case. The way I look at it is, because I don't want to write all that out, is... I go a jump ahead and go, okay, if I go from December 1st, 2014 to December 1st, 2028, how many payments are there? Well, 14 years, two payments a year, that's 28. Going back one payment, which means I add back one, and I get 29. Whichever way you like to go, take the way that's more comfortable for you, okay? The yield is 7.6%. That's payable semi-annually. Everything's compounded semi-annually. Payment, let's see, 10, ooh, 10% bond, yummy. 0 0.1 divided by 2 times by the face value of 25,000. And that face value, of course, is 25,000. Okay. So now we're all set. We can find the value of this bond on June the 1st, 20, 2014. Okay. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. Our bond rate is 10%. The yield is 7.6%. So our bond is paying more than other similar bonds. So this is a desirable bond. We are expecting this bond to be worth a premium amount on June the 1st, 2014, i.e. an amount higher than $25,000. And in fact, we get uh, $30,217. And I'm going to keep the decimals here, uh, 0.94619. The reason why I'm keeping the decimals is because I need it for a subsequent calculation, aka step two. Okay, so in step two, uh, this is where things get a little sideways. Uh, if mistakes are going to be made, it's going to be, nobody likes to do step two for some reason. <laughs> the days between dates function on your calculator. It just gets no love. So what happens? 
We are gonna we're gonna sell the bond on September twenty fifth, two thousand fourteen. On December the first, two thousand fourteen, the company pays whoever is the record holder or whoever is the uh, owner of the bond on that day one hundred percent of the coupon. And the seller is going, hey, whoa, 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 back up there. Between June the first and September twenty fifth, I held that bond. <laughs> I want the interest for that period, right? They're entitled to it, right? They owned the bond for that period. Interest accrued to them, it just wasn't paid, uh, but they're entitled to that per uh, portion of the interest, right? However, the purchaser is gonna get the interest for the whole period. <laughs> That's not fair. They didn't hold the bond for the whole period. Why the heck should they get the interest for the whole period? So, now we gotta allocate this uh, accrued interest. And that involves our good friend, the days between dates. Okay. So we need to find the days between dates from June the 1st to September 25th. How many days did the seller hold that bond? And then the second thing is we need to find the length of the period, June the 1st to December the 1st. Okay. And that portion, so that fraction is the fraction of the interest that uh, essentially the seller wants. Okay, so we'll pause for a sec. Rework the days between dates and then let's jump back in. Okay, hopefully everything went fine. Um, found our days between dates. Now uh, the seller held the bond for 116 days. The length of the period is 183 days, okay? There will never be a six month period longer than 184 days, okay? So if your June 1st to December 1st is greater than 184 days, there's a boo-boo there. Likely the wrong year was entered, okay? So think common sense here. This is not complicated, right? I know how we don't long how long six month periods they may vary a little bit but they don't get too much more than six months right 184 day max so just just keep that aware so the seller held the bond for 116 days out of that 183 days and so now we need to calculate or incorporate into the cash price that sellers the the, the amount of interest uh, of that interest payment that the seller is entitled to so now we take the cash price, which equals to the value on the most recent coupon payment date. And then we work in the interest rate. This is going to be the yield, because that's the only interest rate that really matters right now, divided by two. And it is a fraction of a semi-annual period. That is an exponent up there. Okay. And then we find our cash price. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause for a little bit. Work that out. Make sure it all you know how to sequence that all in your calculator. Okay. So let's hope that went well. Uh, and the ultimate cash price of this bond is thirty thousand nine hundred and forty dollars, and let's call it eighty four cents. Okay. Yeah, a couple of things that we can then calculate. There's no shortcut to the two-step procedure. Okay, it's a two-step process. Don't do start doing anything funky or thinking you found some unique shortcut. It's, unfortunately, I wish it were true, but this is actually fairly streamlined as it is. Accrued interest is just the portion of the period that the seller owned the bond times by the particular coupon payment. Yeah. And if we recall, our coupon payment was $1,250. Okay. So that portion of the coupon payment is what we call the, the accrued interest. Okay. And we would have seen that portion up in the exponent up here anyway, right? So hopefully we have that number handy and we can just do this calculation really quickly. Okay. And then lastly, the quoted price, which just equals to the cash price minus the crude interest, 
which equals to $30,940.84 minus the, again, the accrued interest. And this is the value that you'll see quoted uh, on quoting services like Morningstar and, and, and so on. Morningstar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, on, on quoting services and, and stuff like that and just to reflect the fact that we don't want that accrued interest mucking up our comparison of uh, other bonds by implying that perhaps there's uh, more value there than there really is. Okay, So $30,148.49. Cash price, most important part of that because that's how much you actually pay. Uh, but we want to keep track of the other two items just in case we see them uh, out there in the wild. Alrighty, give that one a shot. It's a really good question. We'll do another one.